also in the Middle Ages about um, what we've called here medieval science and sorcery and essentially the idea of before these kind of things diverge, right? <laughs> so before there is a difference between alchemy and chemistry, before there's a difference between astronomy and astrology. I'll need the clicker to work again. It's okay. There it is. Okay, now it worked. I was just going to suggest putting the spell on it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Someone has cursed my, my clicker. <laughs> okay, so we'll look at medicine before modern medicine tonight, and we're going to look at uh, astrology and astronomy before they diverge, alchemy and chemistry before they diverge, and we're going to look a little bit at the classical Greek philosophical system that is essentially underlying and unifying all of these different disciplines. So... Let's see. Okay, this is, Leandro, the, this clicker's not working, so maybe it needs a new battery. You could do it. Who doesn't have a little piece of paper and a pen? Back there. Come on. Okay, so how many of you don't know? Oops, that's it. You got it? The battery. Okay, good. Thank you. How many of you don't know your star, or actually what it's actually technically your sun, sty sun zodiac sign? Does anybody not know if they're a Pisces or a Capricorn? So you all know that. <laughs> so this is something that's still with us enough that you at least, you know, we may know. I mean, I know I'm an Aries. I was born on April 2nd, and I just have known, I don't know how, however long since I was a little kid, but that's what it is. However, other parts of um, medieval science, medieval medicine, uh, and the theories and that kind of thing are less well known. And so um, one of them that you maybe don't know is, what is your humor? <laughs> You know, do you have a well-balanced humor, or is your humors out of alignment? And what is the, your most, what's your dominant humor? And so we're going to do a little test, <laughs> and you can write down, you know, for each one, and then we'll tally it up, and you can we can figure this question out. Okay, there's a lot of quiz. Okay. It's still. Yeah. It's not moving forward. Okay. So it won't okay. it won't advance just one. Well, I'll have to help you then. Okay. Okay, first, what are your interests? This is these are, these are multiple choice and so therefore it has to be what best describes you. So, A, I'm an educated person, but I don't really have many particular interests. B, I have many interests, but I like to focus on one at a time so I can really develop deep expertise in each one. Uh, C, I'm most interested in people and relationships. D, I have a wide range of interests, but I never picked just one. I prefer to experience something new. So essentially, jack of all trades, master of none. <laughs> You'll have to advance it, Leandro. You just write down A, B, C, or D. Okay, second. Question number two. What is your relationship with money? A, I like to save my money and never waste it. B, I'm good at money management, but I don't mind spending a lot on something that has real value. C, I like to buy things for the people I love. D, I spend all my money. I like special experiences and nice things. Okay, question three. How spontaneous are you? A, not at all spontaneous. I am a careful planner. B, while I'm not a spontaneous person per se, I can make fast decisions when I have to. C, it depends on my mood. Also, I change my mind frequently. D, I'm very spontaneous. I like doing things on the spur of the moment. How energetic are you? <laughs> This quiz is taking more energy than I have. <laughs> B, I have a lot of stamina. I like a marathon runner rather than a sprinter. C, it really depends on my mood each day. 
D, I am super energetic. <laughs> How emotional are you? I'm not emotional. <laughs> B, I always remain calm on the outside. Even when I'm upset, I can solve problems without showing my feelings. C, I'm very sensitive to the feelings of others and in touch with my own emotions. D, I have strong feelings, but I can't always tell what other people are feeling. Are you easily bored? <laughs> I'm never bored. A, I could be alone and live like a hermit. Uh, no, B, no, I'm not dependent on circumstances or others. I'm always doing something interesting. C, not so much as I tend to get attached to the people I'm with and the places I am. And D, yes, this quiz is boring. Make it stop. <laughs> so <laughs> okay, so let's score this one. And essentially, the, what it is, is it, it's, just if we're, it's just if you get mostly A's, mostly B's, mostly C's, or mostly D's, right? And so if you don't have any one particular one that stood out and you're all over the place, then you have a well-balanced... <laughs> You're going to be well-balanced humor, but if you like mostly get all, let's say, A's here, then that means you are melancholic. <laughs> so melancholia. And so according to um, ancient and medieval medicine, that means you're analytical, detail-oriented, you're a deep thinker, a deep feeler. You hate to be singled out in a crowd, and you often strive for perfection. This is caused, little did you know, by an excess of black bile <laughs> in your system. <laughs> Black bile being generated from your spleen. <laughs> How are we going to treat this? If we give you a strong laxative, that will purge the black bile out of your system. So <laughs> that will help to get restore the, um, your natural balance of your humors. Is there really such a thing as black bile? The question is, is there really such a thing as black bile? And the answer is no. <laughs> so so the problem... What there is... Right, the two biles are in fact not, um, not, um, not in a modern medical science are they differentiated. So the idea of it is in terms of observationally, um, when the ancient Greeks, when, when uh, Hipp Hipp uh, Hippocrates and when Galen, what they would do is they would take like a blood sample and the different um, part, as they would separate different parts of it out, um, the white, um, uh, you know, kind of blood cells or whatever are the, is like the yellow bile, the, oh. uh, the the coagulant and stuff like that. I think it's the black bile, the uh, red is the blood, you know, and so, um, and then the liquid is the, um, could, we'll get to whatever, I have to think what they, all the sections are. But anyway, in other words, it's observation based on, well, for example, when they remove different bodily liquids, as opposed to, um, anyway, anything that we now understand in modern medicine. So this is ancient and medieval medicine. So this is the treatment. <laughs> B, if you got all a bunch of Bs, um, you're choleric, which means, uh, and this is what, so melancholic, we, we, you know, melancholy is a word we still use. Choleric is one that we don't so much use, except for maybe um, uh, in, if the word, you know, the disease cholera, right? But essentially it means that you're extroverted, independent, decisive, goal-oriented, practical. You can also be impatient of people who are less logical than you. Uh, it's a nice way of of saying it for their personality here. <laughs> so this is, <laughs> this is apparently, little did you know, caused by an excess of yellow bile in your system which is produced by your gallbladder, according to uh, Galen. So the treatment here is an emetic uh, will induce you to vomit up uh, the yellow, yellow bile and, to, and purge the yellow bile from your system so that uh, your natural humors can be restored in their balance. So if you got a bunch of C's, <laughs> You're phlegmatic. <laughs> Phlegm, that was the other part I was trying to get to. Yeah. So, a phlegmatic person, that means you're relaxed, easygoing, you can even be apathetic. But you're self reliant, you don't show your emotions, you're good at generalizing and making compromises. This is caused by an excess of phlegm <laughs> in your system, <laughs> leaving you cold, because phlegm is cold. <laughs> so, if what we need to do is to administer, for example, hot cups. <laughs> to your skin or maybe even hot irons in order to heat up your humors in general. <laughs> That's one possible treatment. The, these are the, also the strongest treatments that you can have for any of these things. Okay, and if you got mostly Ds, that means you're sanguine. And sanguine is one word that we do still use too as a way to talk about emotion. It means you're talkative, enthusiastic, active, social, you're more extroverted, outgoing, you're willing to take risks. You can also be too impulsive, loud, and lack empathy for others. 
And so this is caused by an excess of blood in your system. So what's our treatment? We're going to get out the leeches, folks. <laughs> you know? So all of you, all of you sanguine people, you know, we got to get that extra blood out of you. So anyway, so essentially you probably then have that much awareness of um, ancient and medieval and early modern medicine. You've seen maybe movies where they take out the leeches or, or we're thinking about the leeches and maybe some of these other things, um, but certainly the these were among all of the, let's say, strongest treatments that uh, uh, medieval and early modern, we won't say early modern, we'll just say ancient and medieval um, um, uh, physicians had at their disposal. Um, I thought, actually, that this was completely lost and the people would probably be totally aware of uh, all of this. How many people have kind of even heard about this medical system? So actually, a lot of you have. <laughs> And so I realized when I went around looking on the internet for clip art and things like that, that there's actually some pretty substantial modern clip art about this because it can, apparently like all things, you know, uh, any, any kind of ancient or medieval system, you know, has made a popular revivals and things like that. And so um, it has made a certain comeback as a kind of now um, pseudo medicine or alternative medicine in this case. Okay. So the system of the four humors, as we've kind of talked about this. So where does this thing come from? We've had some fun I, with the quiz, <laughs> and so, and, and it was an easy quiz. So next time we have a pop quiz, though, don't 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 get complacent. It might be really tough <laughs> next time. <laughs> so you know, with these kind of extreme remedies that uh, the physicians had at their disposal, things like bloodletting, hot cupping, emetics, laxatives, but uh, the system of humors or humoralism was actually a very serious discipline and held kind of amazing sway over Western medicine from Hippocrates in the 5th century and 4th century. Um, uh, and he's the guy for whom the Hippocratic Oath is, na is named, you know. So uh, onward through in the Christian and Muslim Middle Ages and into the 17th century and actually beyond. It's in the 17th century that um, uh, the origins of kind of modern medicine start to disprove um, a lot of these theories and ultimately though it's not even until the middle of the 19th century that um, that it kind of definitively shown that for example there's not such thing as yellow and black bile so even the the sense of these humors are, are but are still people are still following in this kind of tradition until anyway quite recently so less uh, extreme remedies than than these ones that we've kind of talked about and parodied here involved uh, things like herbs, changes in diet, rest, and the like. Or we'll describe see, seeing somebody doing bleeding in a Paris hospital, and this would have been in the 1930s. Okay, bleeding in the 1930s. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't, I mean, we shouldn't imagine that there's probably gone all the way along enough till when the revivals here have been able to almost touch, <laughs> you know, so this unlike some of the practices, for example, uh, when we've talked about, um, let's say, the, the lingering um, paganism to then we get to neo-pagan revivals, there's too big a stretch between where there's no continuity. In this case, there may well have been, you know, overlap between people who were just inheriting it and then a revival of the practices and things like that. <coughs> um, so, okay, so what's the basis? Where does this all come from? So we want to look at how this works. So when we have done lectures in the past, for example, on the pre-Socratic philosophers, so the beginning of um, uh, Western philosophy, Greek philosophy, um, one of the pre-Socratics is a guy named Empedocles who is off in Sicily, and so often these um, before you get to Socrates and his successors where philosophy starts to be focused really on Athens, at the beginning of this thought it's around all of the margins of the frontiers of the, of the Greek world. And Empedocles is often on the island of Sicily. Um, he's in the fifth century, now, we don't know exactly when, um, and he's credited with formulating this theory that all matter is made up of these four classical elements plus um, plus the fifth element, essentially the four, four main earthly elements or uh, sublunar elements in different proportions. So this um, basic cosmology that we don't have too much of Empedocles' own work, so we can't say exactly um, what he was doing, but it's later um, picked up by Aristotle and vastly systematized and spread and, uh, uh, and anyway becomes very widespread ever thereafter. And so essentially we have here um, not what we think of in modern sense as what elements are. So now, of course, we have 
atomic theory and you know, modern atomic theory and also this understanding of you know protons, neutrons, etc., and different types of um, substances as being elements because of their atomic weight and that kind of thing. Um, instead here, what the observations that these are based on uh, by the, in the earliest ancient Greek philosophers here are essentially what we would now think of as like phases of matter. So they're aware of um, gas, they're aware of liquid, they're aware of solid, they're aware of sort of energetic reactions like fire, and so they've essentially understood then that those are what everything is composed of. It's composed of liquid, solid, uh, gas, and, and you know, this essentially energy. And so um, in so doing then, the idea here is that um, everything is composed though of air, earth, fire, and water in different proportions uh, and that those then each have an, a, a, um, a quality that is attached to them. So air and fire share the fact that they are not by nature hot, fire and uh, earth by their nature are dry, water and earth are by their nature cold, and air and water are by their nature wet, is their understanding. Is an old oriental system? There is also, um, there are also South Asian and East Asian versions of this, yeah. And so the, but in, in that case, uh, like you say, in the East Asian one there's five, but it's a different five <laughs> than this, right? We have so. Mike uh, Karpowicz. Yes. Saying that the second symphony of uh, Carl Nielsen is nicknamed the Four Temperaments, with each one of the four movements inspired by one of the four humors. Oh, okay. We're talking about. Yeah, and so temperament is, what, is also another name music. of those systems. So yeah, thank you. Yeah. So so it has had continuing cultural, ongoing cultural echoes, and again, like Elizabeth was saying, ongoing practice, and then even revival now. Uh, but there were also <coughs> plays, for example, in the Renaissance that were written uh, that were just to describe uh, people with the different, uh, essentially, because these are their psychological backgrounds. And so because they also supposedly, people exhibited certain physiologies, uh, the character that is going to be very sanguine, and so in other words, this um, rash uh, young chevalier or something like that who's running around and in, uh, never thinking, you know, always leaping first. <laughs> Uh, will also maybe have ruddy cheeks because uh, because that's a characteristic of being sanguine. So Shaheen has a comment on that. Um, I was just going to make a quick side comment with the sanguine personality. Mm -hmm. So um, I know that recently in the past couple of decades they've discovered that there's a parasite that's transmitted from cats. Ooh. Um, and it, I think it's called uh, toxiplasma. Okay. And it's usually it usually infects rats and mice and makes them uh, unafraid of the cat and makes them attracted to cat urine. So uh. and they thought it didn't affect humans, but it does, and it makes humans engage in super risky behavior. So oh. it's a parasite that changes your personality. Oh, okay. So that there is an actual parasite that gives you the effect of being sanguine. Then, <laughs> so <laughs> wow. <coughs> Cat urine. Oh, cat urine. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. So where are these observational? Um, so just a uh, classic uh, uh, ancient Greeks, as they would describe this, they would talk about, for example, how um, essentially all four of these elements would be present, let's say, in a log, right? So for one thing, you know that if the log is freshly cut and it's still quite wet, it's harder for it to uh, uh, burn since fire is in opposition to the water, but as it dries out, it makes it more easy to burn. Um, and then when you ignite it, then the fire, as far as the Greeks were concerned, where is it released from the wood, as is the air, which is released in the form of smoke, and maybe sometimes in steam. Uh, and then also uh, a little bit of liquid will come out or water will kind of drip out of it, but there's not much left because it's dry already wood. And then what's left is essentially ash, and the ash then uh, according to this theory, is much more uh, wholly con con uh, composed of the element of earth, and so therefore is much less flammable. So you can do this again, right? So you've already reduced it from a, a more mixed state that has all of the elements in it into a, a state, actually all the four states where they're more separated, depending on where they all went to. So that's the idea. Okay, what's the fifth element? <laughs> 
Ether, yes. So it's not, it's not love, <laughs> you know, as, a, as in the movie. The fifth element, or quintessence, which is just another way of saying fifth element, um, actually, Empedocles does include love in his system, but love uh, is, is actually affecting, he's saying that that's a force that is actually affecting uh, the four elements, as opposed to having it be the fifth element. So the fifth element, ether, is um, essentially the element that is above the lunar sphere. So this is the, the celestial element. This is what's going on in the heavens and what the heavens are composed of as opposed to the, the ones that are sublunar, the earthly ones that we concern ourselves with here. So there's the four terrestrial elements along with the fifth element, celestial element, and they're associated then with uh, each one of them with the platonic solids. We've seen how excited all of um, the pre-Socratics and also later Greek philosophers are with mathematics since they've discovered essentially um, something that exists that has, um, it doesn't have physical existence, and yet, uh, and yet it can be kind of shown to uh, always be true. And so therefore, um, trying to understand the existence and essence of things that don't necessarily have physical existence or can't have physical existence becomes one of the core um, issues for all of this early philosophy. And so one of these things that is so super neat is that there are only, you know, these five uh, uh, geometric forms, essentially the little triangular pyramid, the cube, uh, the isohedron, the dodecahedron, you know, that are, are able, and the hex, what's it, hexahedron, what's it called? Um. Isohedron, dodecahedron, and the, hex, anyway, yeah, the one with the six. <laughs> or the pint. Decahedron? No, no. that's twenty. No. Dodecahedron is Dode 12. 12. Dode is 12. Dode anyway, 12. an isohedron. Anyway, so there's another <laughs> one. <laughs> so there's one more. What? Isocahedron. Isocahedron. Yeah, I think so. Isocahedron. So I should have written them down, yeah. the names. Because <laughs> that way I'd remember. <laughs> anyway, I remember them as being the dice that you had when you played Dungeons and Dragons, right? <laughs> Yeah, so, <laughs> but in any way, you know, anyway, each one of those then, the idea is they're, they're associated with that, and in some cases, um, the philosophers thought this literally. So they thought that essentially when you got down to the tiny, the tiny um, components that, uh, that fire would, um, would essentially be like that, and one of the reasons why you can tell that it's so, uh, so pointy like that is that why fire hurts and everything like that to, to, be, to the touch, whereas, um, for example, water, you know, is, is in this shape that's more spherical here that is why it's all, you know, uh, liquidy altogether and making that kind of liquid feel. And earth uh, being the only one of these um, five uh, solids that, uh, that tessellates so that you could actually make essentially um, a foundation or brick or buildings or something like that, that that's the reason why the earth is like that. You know, in other words, it's solid and made of all these little tiny, tiny cubes like that. So that certainly is one of the um, thoughts that they had that maybe uh, each one of these elements is essentially that shape. Yes? And what is sphere? Where does duct fit in? Where does what? Sphere. Yeah, where does sphere fit in? Yeah, they don't have an element for sphere. <laughs> godly, is it not godly, the highest? Yeah, is not sphere so godly? Does it represent God or? You have to hold the microphone. Like <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're good at microphone holding, but not yourself. Um, I, I think, so because, so the, this, the last one here, the 20-sided one, um, is, is so much closer to a sphere that that's essentially, you know, the one that, I mean, that's the spiritual one, right? So the quintessence is the one um, that is the one that's closest to the divine or is, is the divine one of these elements. But it's usually because they, if they didn't have that fifth one, they would have made it sphere, I think, like you said. <laughs> but given the fact that they have five of these, they don't have, sphere isn't one of them. So these are each one's a geometric form as opposed to um, with a, with a multi-sided object. Okay. So we've talked about this a few times, is this pre-Newtonian um, theory of motion um, that is, again, all based on then these four elements. And you can kind of see it in the diagram up there of earth water, air, and fire in Latin uh, there, where the Earth is at the center of the cosmos, it's a sphere, and everything, um, you know, uh, essentially Earth and water are the heavier elements, and they're, they're actually seeking to go downward towards the center of the cosmos, which is why Earth, being the heaviest, gets down at the bottom, 
and that's where the, the whole solidity of where we're standing is from. And then on top of that, then is water, like the ocean that is on top of the earth, or lakes, and then uh, air, and then finally fire, you know, which is at the, you know, it's just always trying to get up and escape. You know, whenever fire is lit, it doesn't go down <laughs> ever. But anyway, it, its idea of it is that um, not, there's no idea of gravitation, so we don't have any of Newton's, any, any of Newton's laws or theories. Um, for gravitation or anything like that. And so um, the, the, the sense of it is, is that the reason why things are seeking these places is because that's their purpose or end, uh, as opposed to, anyway, our, now, our understanding that we have now. Okay, so how do we get to the humors? <laughs> so classical medicine. So integrated into this elemental theory then is classical uh, medicine. So Hippocrates, who we've mentioned, uh, another pre-Socratic who's not quite a contemporary, he's a little bit about one generation after Empedocles, he applies then that elemental theory or the theory of these four elements to a systems of the body, so of living things, of living animals. Um, essentially those four elements are aligned with four body fluids that we've talked about which are called humors. And so the alignment here is fire with the yellow bile, um, uh, earth with black bile, air with blood, and phlegm with water, and also with those same um, then elemental and uh, qualities that of each one of those having that. And so therefore, um, you're, in that same sense, there's like a natural quality to each one of these particular bodily fluids which you know, therefore are also meant to be in balance, like everything is supposed to be in balance in sort of this harmonious Greek system, but uh, can get out of balance, which is what we talked about in the, in the quiz. So um, from that early part from Hippocrates uh, through the whole Hellenistic period and into the, to the Roman period, um, in the same way that we have uh, a kind of a, a Roman systemization of astronomy by Ptolemy, um, we have uh, by Galen, who is a, a Greek in the Roman Empire. Uh, Aelius Galen, Galenus substantially adds then to um, what the, the corpus of ancient Greek uh, medicine up until that time. So this guy is like super prolific. <laughs> so Galen, um, apparently uh, all of his surviving texts, we have so much of his work. So on the one hand, he wrote like crazy, wrote a lot of stuff, but then on the other hand, it's quite popular. So it's a lot has survived. Uh, and so as a result, nearly half of all extant uh, ancient Greek literature is by Galen. <laughs> so that's a lot. Um, through things like dissection uh, of animals and actually vivisection of, of humans. Um, it was illegal in the Roman Empire to dissect humans, but he was able to cut living people open, I guess. <laughs> so um, Galen pioneered um, understanding of things like the circulatory system. And so he was able to um, cut animals open and essentially observe that, uh, that there are essentially two, your, your circulatory system has essentially two different colors. If you've ever seen the diagrams of, you know, like essentially the arteries and the, vein, and the veins and the one are the blue and the one are red, the way it's represented in our, in our diagrams. And um, Galen uh, speculated that both of these were separate systems uh, and so, and that they were circulating independently of each other as opposed to um, how we now understand it, or that essentially the, both go through the heart and they're uh, at oxygen's added, right, to once, you know, from the arteries, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> as a result of all this theorizing, as a result of all of this prolific writing and explanations that Galen had, um, this is a system that held sway for some 1,300 more years or more, actually, as we've seen, um, and so it ends up having a, a complete system. So we have this idea of the humor, which is to say the particular bodily fluid that you have. Um, we have the organ, which uh, Galen believed or theorized generated that, um, that liquid. So all blood is produced by the liver, as far as uh, Galen and other classical um, physicians felt, which is not the case. Um, but anyway, that was the theoretical possibility. The idea that, again, yellow bile and black bile um, don't necessarily refer to anything in terms of actual modern uh, identification, but there were these um, organs that were producing something or other, uh, you know, and so they determined that the yellow bile is here coming from the gallbladder 
and the black bile from your spleen. And then the phlegm, uh, I guess your brain and your lungs are working in concert to produce uh, phlegm. <laughs> and yeah, you can produce phlegm out of your lungs um, yourself. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, and then each one of these, like we said, is associated with a element, air, earth, fire, water. Each one of those elements has qualities. Um, each one of those then leads to a temperament. And each one of those temper temperaments um, is not just found in like everything, every, every one of these components in the same way that air, earth, fire, and water is found in everything uh, that's not a pure version of each one of those things uh, in that same exact way um, that even if you, let's say, are, um, I always thought before I, I took that test just now, I always thought that I was sanguine, but it turns out that I'm um, choleric. So anyway, that's what I'm now, that's what I get from the quiz anyway. So, so anyway, so it's true. So anyway, so when now that I'm, um, but just because I'm choleric doesn't mean I don't have a bunch of sanguine and phlegmatic component within me. It just means that that's my dominant trait. And then that same exact way that um, uh, since everything here is kind of this interconnected system, essentially there's also in person's life cycle, from infancy to, infancy to youth, to adulthood, to old age, there's sort of a natural tendency to have one of these or other be your kind of uh, ruling, uh, your ruling uh, humor. And so, you know, it, in, when you're young, you tend to be, you know, way more hot-blooded uh, and, and, and decisive when you're um, maybe in youth, and then when you're in old age, you're coughing up a lot more phlegm and, <laughs> and that kind of a thing. And so then these are also then associated with the seasons, right? And so I think that Mike was even, you know, well, I guess the Four Seasons is a different musical number, That's but different <laughs> totally different musical number. But anyway, so we also have four seasons in uh, the Northern Hemisphere anyway. <laughs> so not in, so much in the tropics and stuff, but so with the seasons. But there's okay. also a season in the Southern Hemisphere for the record. They're just the reverse. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in the Southern Hemisphere, people are, um, are sanguine at the end of their life, right? <laughs> throughout their lives. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sanguine throughout their lives <laughs> in the Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> okay. So from theory to practice. So when you have this kind of a theoretical system, um, what did they, what, how are they trying to implement it? And we've seen, we, at the beginning, we talked a little bit about some of the extreme um, uh, techniques for trying to balance the humors. The goal, though, is to balance the humors. So Galen and his medieval successors believe that all disease uh, results from imbalance, right? So they call this dyscrasia, dyscrasia, which is imbalance in your humors. The goal of the medicine is to create eucrasia, which is, sounds you, you, you so crazy, <laughs> but anyway, you was always good, right? So uh, in EU, right? Like eulogy, you're speaking, speaking well of the dead or um, utopia with a EU would be a good place, whereas utopia, with a, uh, as, we, as we spell it, it means nowhere, right, as opposed to good place. So they're look, trying to find eucrasia or balance. And so um, a lot of the things that they were doing, of course, um, they didn't have modern medicine and more or less no um, until very recently when modern medicine started to become amazingly effective uh, and is able to um, do all sorts of things between immunizations uh, in, it, with penicillin and uh, with all kinds of different surgical techniques and then now um, you know with other kinds of more radical techniques for to for going after cancer and things like that um, we have had an experience that is different from anybody else in all of human history which is before this time in this one location when this is all a bit possible essentially there wasn't a lot you could do <laughs> that has a lot more effect than placebo. Uh, and we know even to this day that placebo actually has um, a quite a good effect and lots and lots of different things um, you know, can only be shown. It's like, for example, one of the things that Landro admits that, that there's studies that show mindfulness meditation has all sorts of beneficial effects, but it doesn't actually... Compared to what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Compared to what? So I mean, so lots of other things are equally like you were saying. Like having a dog and petting your dog has that same effect as does placebo. 
you know, and so in other words, so placebo can have, a, you know, which is, you know, something where you bel just believe it's going to cure you, even though it's just a sugar pill, um, that that will have a serious effect. And so a lot of the things uh, that that pre-modern medicine was doing was quite effective, um, you know, when you, if you, at a certain point, if a person has a big fever and you start doing like serious bloodletting, that can kill them as, as can some of these very powerful uh, purgatives and emetics and things like that if they were already um, quite sick. But doing other things like having people have rest, trying to get them to restore a balanced diet, they maybe have been eating, you know, irregularly or drinking lots and that kind of thing, giving them a lot of attention, uh, doing other kinds of things that actually is likely to um, all by itself be helpful and did cause you know a certain degree of cures although obviously some things are not curable in that sense. Elizabeth. My tutor when I was an undergraduate once said that uh, up, to, up until about 1890 going to a doctor would decrease rather than increase your chances of survival. Yes. So yeah, I think that, that that also the case can be made for that. <laughs> so, you know, and so especially, for example, if you were going to go to um, a place like, you know, there was one of the hospitals or someplace like that, because then you're especially, you're becoming uh, infected by other sick people that are all around and things like that. And the doctors are also, uh, because they don't have basics of, uh, they don't know anything about bacteriology. They don't know anything about, you know, this kind of washing and cleanliness. They um, uh, they're infecting people, so they're actually also spreading disease and this kind of a thing. Um, but that said, some of these things that they're doing with, you know, t advising you to change your diet, there are certain things that they're doing that were effective techniques, so it wasn't that there was nothing going, going on through this whole time, but like you say, it may not have even been better than if they just did, if you just calmed down yourself and not, <laughs> you know, not, not done anything. So, okay. And in that same sense, <laughs> There is, in fact, throughout the Middle Ages uh, in the Christian West, a, um, a competing um, way to be healed that is also has more or less the same kind of um, level of effectiveness or not, you know, as medicine would have been able to do. So it's a comparable thing, which is to say, um, what we'll, I, I call now ritual healing, um, uh, that it takes place essentially what people in the Middle Ages thought of as being supernatural miracles. And so with the fall of the Western Roman Empire, so in the kind of area that we deal with in France and, and England and Italy and Spain, Latin knowledge of Greek medicine really atrophies. And so they're still doing this kind of thing, but it's often can be supplemented with, let's say, much more superstitious practices. And so we've seen this before when we've done our, our um, for example, lecture, uh, Arab perspectives on the Crusades and uh, highly trained, essentially in the Greek philosophical tra tradition, um, Muslim uh, physicians, you know, are, are viewing essentially these Western um, European physicians and just be just they're just like, well, these guys, you know, they are they're horrible. They are they're just you know doing all of this crazy superstitious stuff. So one of the one of the practices is, for example, uh, because there's a sense that maybe what the thing that's happening. The problem with you is that there's a demon inside of you, and so, for example, cutting open a like a making an incision of a cross in your forehead or something like that is maybe one way to um, allow the demon to get out, uh, or it could also give you you know brain damage and an infection and kill you immediately, you know, which it also did. So anyway, some of those kind of things were were supplemented, but alongside medicine, um, another thing that was that existed is a systematized way for ritual healing. So one of the things that might happen if you're in an agricultural society where, let's say, 97% of everybody is essentially a peasant. And so something might happen where you are part of your peasant village and community and you do something that uh, means that you have to essentially be kicked out of the society. You've, you've committed something uh, that isn't enough that they're gonna kill you. <laughs> Um, you know, like, you know, some, if you murder somebody or whatever, some kind of a crime like that, but you've done something that's causing such horrible shame or whatever, and that could have either a, um, you either just go and are, are, are losing your livelihood and you become a beggar, or that could also be associated with um, even, a, it could cause a physiological effect, you know, where a person experiences, they're so struck at this being 
kicked out of society and losing their whole way of life and things like that, they also develop some kind of paralysis or they become, develop a kind of a blindness. They can't see anymore or any kind of thing like that. And so then they might spend um, years and years um, living essentially with the beggars, and the homeless people essentially on the margins of the, all of these societies who are now living um, along the roadsides and who are begging for, for alms and who are outside of churches and things like that. And then though at key moments, um, the bishop or the priest, uh, you, know, you will in the church, they will have, for example, the relics of the saints. They will have a, a translation of the relics where they move the saints' relics around and they'll invite people essentially to come for healing. And so it can be a situation where you have lived as a blind beggar. You go into this kind of ritual healing um, you are understood to have been healed by having gone through this transformation. In some cases, there is an actual um, physio physiological change. In some cases, who knows to what degree you were before really paralyzed and whatnot. In some cases, the, the healing doesn't work, right? But in many cases, essentially, it's understood that there is a miracle, but the, one of the, the real miracle and, and avenue here is that then you are able to be restored to inside the society. You no longer have to be a beggar, but now you can go back and live um, either as a caretaker at the church or any other kind of thing where you are part of the society again. And so this is something that um, it's hard for us to grasp because we really are living in this time period of modern medicine where um, you know, we have particular effects that are coming with, you know, different, you know, different things and different procedures. But given, you know, that this is essentially stacked up alongside uh, what the actual physicians are doing, and they're, you know, fairly similar, and also, you know, another thing that would be stacked up against this is, you know, a local, you know, um, wise woman. You know, so it's just essentially folk magic, which I'm not going to go into, but essentially that would also be um, something that is also, it's, which is not the philosophical magic, but is essentially the localized remedies of what people are, are doing there. Um, so given that all of those things only have so much efficacy, any one of them, you know, may actually, they can actually yielding, act, you know, reasonable results. Yes. I have a question, just the slides before. Yep. You said um, there's an imbalance that causes all kind of diseases, like either it's too much or too low. What is the optimum well, stage for in this yeah. system? I mean, the <laughs> optimum stage is, you know, you're crazy, right? So it's like the four, idea. If you have this four system. Right. And so then what we should have been able to do, I guess, in your test is you should have gotten equal numbers of A's, B's, C's, and D's, <laughs> you know, or something like that, you know, so then you'd be. Six questions. <laughs> Oh, so it's hard to get them. I should have had eight questions, <laughs> you know, so that you could achieve balance. I've, I stacked the dice in my own favor here, you know, uh, in terms of that. But essentially, yeah, the idea of it is, is that when not, no, no one of these things is, is predominant, you know, dominating, right? And so you aren't doing rash stuff uh, and so, or any of the other kinds of things. And specifically, though, how they can tell you're sick or out of balance is because you're sick. <laughs> And so that's more or less the system um, is self uh, vindicating, <laughs> self validating, right? Because essentially, what they what happens is is that you you have pneumonia, or something like that, and that then you get a fever. Then it's clearly because you're so hot, you can tell that you know you are, um, you know, sanguine and possibly uh, choleric, right? <laughs> And so then as a result of that, um, you, can t they can, you can tell that, you know, you're out of, you know, you know uh, the heat is showing that you're, you're out of uh, balance. And so you want to go back to just what everybody else is like, you know, just a regular peasant who's farming or if you're a noble, you know, whatever, you know, the kind of go back to fighting and stuff like that in, 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 in normal health, right? So hopefully this is just like, this is the system of what, what normal health is if you aren't having any any negative conditions. It's when you have all of these kinds of, any kind of symptom, this is the, what they're understanding that the explanation for why you are having some kind of symptom is because of out of balance. Okay, so anyway, we're talking here a little bit about uh, the Christian West, but um, there's another major error and more important error actually of uh, ancient Greek medicine uh, in the Islamic world, in the Muslim world. And so Greek medicine actually survives a lot better in the Muslim world where Gaelic's many texts were translated quite early on into Arabic. 
Including even, for example, um, the only biography that we have of him, we only have the Arabic, we don't have, the Greek doesn't survive. Numerous Muslim physicians and philosophers built on uh, this basic idea of humoralism, the, hu the system of humors, uh, including Al-Razi, uh, who's in the 9th century and early 10th century, who considered, uh, for example, the effects of climate on general health. And we had, um, we had when we did the um, uh, Arab perspectives on the West, we were talking about how um, since the uh, people like Al-Razi were talking about how there is essentially um, the different climate zones, and if you were living in the, in the nice Mediterranean climate like he was, that that's where your humors are all in really good effect. But if you're like the Franks, uh, the Westerners, who are all living in the cold area, that's why they, um, they are all totally out of humor. And so that's why their skin is pale white and lacks any color and all these kind of things because of their living in a climate that affects their, um, their general health. And that's why they're so rash and they constantly attack us for no reason and they're barbarians and they smell so bad and all those kind of things because they live they're from a bad climate, uh, we Westerners. So also then uh, uh, the polymath uh, Ibn Sina, Avicenna, as he's called in the West, um, who in the early 11th century is just, uh, his writings on, on pretty well everything um, have major effects both in the Muslim world but especially also as they're translated into the uh, Latin uh, cause a intellectual revolution. Um, or help with one in the Renaissance of the 12th century. So Avicenna, uh, after the Islamic Golden Age here, in addition to all of his works, so he's writing on all of the topics that we're talking about to tonight, astronomy, alchemy, geography, cosmology, logic, mathematics, physics, philosophy, theology. He made very significant contributions to medieval medicine through, for example, anatomical studies. So this is a um, diagram of nervous systems from one of his texts in Arabic. And so you can see that the, it's no longer the case for him anyway that he wasn't, he wasn't um, under the same strictures about not uh, doing dissection that Galen had been under. He, for example, identifies the potential of airborne transmission of diseases. Uh, lots of other insights, for example, practical stuff. If uh, there's a, uh, he's the first person to write about if there's a um, problem uh, in delivery to be able to start using forceps, um, for mm -hmm. example. Um, so there's a bunch of different things like that. Um, sometimes called the um, father of early modern medicine. So for the West, um, as with so much then of Greek science, serious study of med medicine is reintroduced and reinjected into the Latin West via Islam along with the Muslim texts. So they don't, the Westerners don't only just get Aristotle, they get Avicenna who is explaining Aristotle. So all of the different uh, recent thought about how to reconcile, for example, a monotheistic religion, although I'll be at a little different one, uh, with uh, ancient Greek philosophy is already all of that's been tackled a lot by Muslim thinkers and that's the kind of thing that um, people like Anselm and Abelard and uh, Augustine are busily um, not Augustine, but Augustine of Canterbury, but anyway, not, not, not so much that, but anyway, these later thinkers. So when the, this, for example, starts the um, existence of the universities in the medieval West, which are essentially a creation of the medieval uh, Christian churches, but the ones that um, we have, like for example, Paris and Oxford, which are focused on more things like philosophy and theology, and Bologna, which is, for example, on Roman law, the, the two that are really focused on medicine, uh, Montpelier and Salerno, are these ones that are in that immediate transitional zone. So Salerno is down in the Norman Kingdom of Sicily that has a uh, large Greek, uh, Jewish, and Muslim populations. Montpelier is in the, um, essentially the Provence area, the Languedoc area anyway, and is um, close to um, Muslim Spain, and so Muslim doctors or more, more often even Jewish doctors who were trained in the uh, Muslim world come and are essentially court physicians and also are teachers uh, and tra personal transmitters in addition to all the texts that they bring, uh, revolutionizing essentially or re you know, bringing um, Western uh, humoralist medicine into line with what had been understood in the Islamic world. So 
you know, this gets us to like this kind of amazing composite uh, medieval scientific uh, philosophical worldview and diagram. I feel like like the the monk who drew this thing, <laughs> you know, <laughs> has got to have been like just so happy because you could really you know have a sense that you really understand everything about how the world <laughs> exists because you can do a here a cosmological diagram where you really have it all you know fit together. So not only do you have you know the elements, air, earth, you know, fire and water. You have their qualities that they share, dry, cold, um, wet, hot. You have um, around here the zodiac, Aries, you know, Taurus, Gemini, and the corresponding calendar. You have the cardinal directions, east, west, north, south. Um, you have the, these, again, these moments of the, the seasons and also life cycle, so essentially just how you can understand more or less every component of life, the universe, and everything. Yeah. Well, interestingly, Pisces and Aquarius is on the fire and air, not on the, not, not close to water. Yeah, so you're right. So, they, so in fact, in his diagram here, he's not taking into account the, um, the way the astrological <laughs> signs are working. So this is, this is actually in, in um, you're right, that the, the, the zodiac is in zodiacal order, you know, or whatever cal calendar order, as opposed to the fire signs. We'll get to that when we get to, um, to astrology. But you're right, each one of those should, like you say, be corresponding to one yeah. of the elements, which it's not. Summer, <laughs> winter. Right, yeah, we got summer over here. I know, it's like winter, it's, it's in the fire area. Yeah. Right, and on, yeah, it's over in the, so that part of it doesn't work as well. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it could be. Yeah, so maybe these are constantly, you know, actually in motion. That would be very cool. Because in the southern hemisphere, when it's Capricorn occurs Pisces season, it is hot. That's true. They weren't so much worried about the southern hemisphere. I know that we, I know that we think about the southern hemisphere a lot here, <laughs> you know, because of, <laughs> but I think that the, the monks weren't worried about it. <laughs> so anyway, okay. But we also have uh, Australians watching, so I know. Yeah, we 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 are thinking about the southern hemisphere here. <laughs> I'm just saying the monks weren't thinking about it. Okay, so I was just at the uh, Aga Khan um, museum, and they have this amazing last for Saturday, and they have this amazing um, medieval uh, Andalusian uh, astrolabe, which is this uh, astronomical and also for use for astrological calculations. Um, uh, the one that they have is in, uh, is in Arabic, Hebrew, and Latin, which is pretty, pretty neat. But essentially, these, this, this uh, cross-pollination that's happening in Sicily and especially in Spain. Uh, and, um, and so, <coughs> with, you know, moving from medicine now to astronomy slash astrology through the Middle Ages, um, we've said before that the primary reason that Christians and Muslims um, uh, and Jews, actually all three have for, for astronomy and astrology is actually astrological. People are very not, they don't, they don't actually get over um, wanting the idea that you may be able to predict your future. <laughs> so divination is always important. But Christians um, need some astronomy and math in order to calculate Easter, which is a really complicated thing to do. Uh, Muslims use astronomy to determine uh, latitude in the direction of Mecca. And so there's reasons about why you need to be able to um, use the stars in order to do astronomical calculation. So Ptolemy, we'd mentioned, um, uh, let's see, he's here. He's a second century Roman citizen from Alexandria. He's not related to the uh, famous dynasty of Ptolemies, Claudius Ptolemy and Cleopatra, uh, but he has that same name. Anyway, he's an astronomer, astrologer, a geographer, and a mathematician, and he's usually credited with the Ptolemaic system, although uh, he's really an heir then to Aristotle and earlier <coughs> Greek systems. He fixes it a little. So he has a book you know, that comes into the West that's called the Tetra Biblos. Um, and as I mentioned here, there's really no difference between astrology and astronomy uh, for them. Um, the reason for it is that there's, they understood anyway that there's clearly a relationship between um, heavenly objects 
and what happens on Earth. So something is going on. They couldn't describe it, but it's essentially force at a distance. So why uh, are the tides affected in some way by the moon? Um, and also other kinds of things like, um, uh, you know, the sun, of course, is, is, you know, in the seasons and things like that. You know, those are causing, you know, the, the movement of the heavens are causing the change of seasons. The sun's daily motion, uh, whether it's up or not, is causes w whether it's warm or not. You know, this sort of thing. So these are ways of understanding that something is happening at a distance. And so the, the extrapolation is, well, if it's all connected here, um, something more could maybe be happening uh, too. So anyway, these are canonical for astrology. Um, the book becomes, in the, one of the main books is, uh, that uh, makes its way into uh, Latin as the Almagest, <laughs> uh, because again, it's like, like a, the rest comes through the Arabic, uh, so Arabic Almagesti for uh, the Greek Magesti, which is greatest. So it's originally called the Mathematica Syntaxis and is preserved in the Muslim world and translated into Latin twice in the 12th century. And it just has an enormous effect on astronomy and science in general. Um, so one of the ways that uh, we can kind of even see a lot of this legacy, besides even the name Almagest, um, is that, for example, all, nearly all of the English names for stars are all um, have Arabic origin. So we, we even think of names like, actually all the names of stars, but if, if, if stars name, are, are named things like Altair, you know, then you can just see the, the, the Arabic for the in front of you know, the word, or Aldebaran. All of these words that are like that, um, I mean, are Arabic loan words, and our biggest chunk of Arabic loan words are essentially all the names of the stars. I have a college classmate who's an astronomer, so is his wife. Their son is called Rigel, and their daughter is called Lyra. Wow. <laughs> People, you know, when I <laughs> this trend is, is, has been pretty amazing. So when I was, um, when I was born in, in the United States in the 1970s, it had, we had pretty well whittled down for um, white suburban Americans anyway, we had pretty whittled, well whittled down to like 12 names for boys and and just about as many for girls. And so everybody who's my age, uh, uh, who is a girl is named Jennifer, <laughs> you know? And so, but now it's amazing, you know, that also, I think everybody who is a generation X or whatever got upset about the fact that everybody was named Matt, you know, and Jennifer. And so now they've named their kids everything, you know? So it's amazing, yeah, so all of the different names. Okay, your sister's name is Jennifer, yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying anything against Jennifer, so it was, a, it was, the, it was the most popular name. Girl, if, if your name's Jennifer, you're likely <laughs> a girl born in the 70s, in the same way that like when my niece, um, who's just entering college right now, is named Emily. So that was like the top name 18 years ago for girls. Uh, you know, and so anyway, but there, but it was nowhere near as big a bump as Jennifer was, right? So if you do those things, because everybody's named everything. So, you know, um, anyway. kids are named all kinds of wonderful things now. It could be named Altair and Rigel, like you say, <laughs> and all that kind of thing. So other words, though, are, there's a bunch of other technical loan words in astronomy that have also come. So zenith, azimuth, these are also Arabic loan words because essentially all of uh, uh, astron astronomy and astrology is uh, brought, carted back over into the Latin West through um, transmission by, at this time by the, from Arab science. So we've looked at this a little bit before when we've done the Ptolemaic universe, but essentially the idea of the cosmos inherited from Aristotle and Ptolemy is there is a spherical earth at the center, and then uh, ever out from that there are uh, the seven uh, uh, mo moving planets. So in this case, every one of the celestial objects that isn't part of the fixed stars that are out at the final sphere so where all the stars that are in the constellations are never move in apart from each other, they all move together, as according to your observation from Earth. Whereas everything from Jupiter to Mars to Venus to the Moon to the Sun, they move around in the sky against uh, those fixed stars. So the constellations stay the same, but the others, these planets, is what it meant originally, is essentially a moving celestial object against the fixed stars. Dante's Inferno. So yeah, so, Dan so the, the comment is that Dante's Inferno is based on that. So Dante's Inferno is also, um, he's like, it's like written um, just immediately like after Aquinas um, writes out essentially the, the Summa Theologica and, or it's not, 
how is it? It's, 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 we always call it Summa Theologica, but it's Theologia, I think is what it is. But anyway, um, so when the, the sum of theology is summed up by Aquinas, um, Dante's read that, and it's like he almost just makes a, a, a novel, you know, or a big epic poem about, like you say, this reconciled Aristotelian, Ptolemaic um, uh, uh, cosmology that exists in, in, in essentially this perfect system that Aquinas has made. And so now they, now essentially the, you, the Dante is just making, making a wonderful picture of it. So I was mentioning before this idea that the fixed stars, if you, if you do a, um, a, uh, a camera that you set it up so that you can have them all turn, they'll all move around. What's the star in the middle? The North Star. Polaris. Yeah, Polaris, the North Star, exactly. And so that one's the one that doesn't move, but they, they all turn around it. Um, and so then, uh, and meanwhile, though, then the planets move around um, you know, throughout the year, uh, as you observe from the Earth anyway, uh, against those. And so when they do that, they, though, are all moving more or less um, through this one particular line that we call the ecliptic, which is also um, the zodiac. And so all of the, um, all of the constellations, the 12 constellations, you know, that are in that one path that all the planets run around in, and the sun and the moon, um, that uh, is essentially why the zodiac is called out as being especially important in astronomy and astrology, especially astrology, right? Yeah, yeah, Robert. At the University of Toronto in the astronomy department, they have monthly free lectures. So yeah. they had one of the technician guys there up and it was explaining that there were 88 constellations. Oh, uh -huh. And then the lady on Coast to Coast was uh, uh, doing the interview. She was the astrologer. And she said, yeah, there's all these extra ones, but there's a ruling laid down that we're only using 10 or 12. Right. Well, this is the planets. What will happen is, um, so there's a bunch of other constellations over here that aren't in the zodiac, right? So here's Cassiopeia. You know, we we got we have talked about the North Star, and so that's in the Little Dipper, or or I'm sorry, the, the Little Bear. Anyway, I mean, it's, you know, Ursa Minor, but it's also we call it the Little Dipper. Um, you know, so anyway, that constellation doesn't apply to astrology because you will never look up in the night sky and see Venus up there. <laughs> so Venus is a wandering a wandering planet. If you were at nighttime observing. But Venus will never be up there in Polaris. It will only be in one of these uh, 12 constellations. So all of the planets, including the moon and the sun, only stay in this dotted yellow line. They don't wander all the way around here. And so why is that? Why don't they go over there? So that's where that 12 fixed comes into being. That that's right. Oh, yep. because, because what we understand now, but they didn't know then, is that there is essentially a plane you know, of how the solar system works and as the different planets orbit the sun, you know, they are all in that same plane. It would have been completely possible. There are, let's say, a, in some star systems, if you have a, like a rogue planet that has been captured, it could come in and it could be, you know, it could be doing this. And so, you know, that comets and things like that do that. But the, but the, the planets that you can actually see, uh, so the ones that the ancients had available, are all in that same plane. And so that's why the 12 <laughs> signs of the zodiac are so important, right? <laughs> because essentially, um, are there 12? You could have divided those, um, you could have divided those stars. Constellations are, are fairly arbitrary, right? So you, you can just, you, they, need, they wanted to make 12. <laughs> so 12 they picked, you know, so that, so that they could have divided that up into made 20 constellations that they wanted to. But the ancient Babylonians already made it to that number in order to have, why, why, would, you, why would you want 12? Yeah, to get to the monthly cycle, so that so that we could have um, essentially uh, the months kind of line up with the solar year. I mean, they don't properly, right? But essentially, it's part of this calculation. And so, as a result of that, um, they picked the number of constellations based on the number of um, the length that the the lunar year is matching up against the solar year, as opposed to starting with constellations and trying to figure this out. 
yeah. <laughs> There's all kinds of wonderful reasons why. And it ends up being a great number. As opposed to 365, <laughs> which is a mess. And a quarter. <laughs> and that has, yeah, 365 and a quarter, which has, you know, confounded everybody trying to make a calendar, you know, throughout all of history. The 12, 12 months going into a year is this wonderful, um, coincidence that ended up being, you know, like you say, there's so many wonderful things that you can do with the magic number 12. And so that ends up being really good. Just like the kind of, um, again, completely, there's no particular reason why it should be this way, but it is enough to understand why it completely confused um, everybody in antiquity all through the Middle Ages, which is the, when you're from the earth and observing, the sun and the moon both kind of look like they're the same size, <laughs> you know? And so that's like, um, that's confusing, you know, because it could have been it could have been any quite different from that. So it would be completely possible if we had a um, uh, a sun that let's say was a bigger bigger colder sun, then then it could be a lot bigger in the sky, and we could have had a moon that's any size, you know. So there so there would have been any number of different things that would have been quite different, you know, if we had been um, if we had been in the star system where we're on a, a moon that is orbiting a gas giant that's or orbiting a star, then we would have had a completely different set of stuff in, in antiquity to work with. As it is, having the sun and the moon be the same size is enough to really, you know, that's very confounding to people because you'd want that to be um, uh, something to that. Uh, Valerie has a comment or a question. <laughs> Yeah, I'm kind of surprised at that actually because you know I'm, I'm sure people here have you know if you're older have seen like a total eclipse of the moon, and you can tell it's like it looks like a dark browny orange ball with like bumps and stuff you know you can see with the naked eye hanging yeah. in the sky, right? Yeah, and it, it you know it's just like totally changes its nature when it's in and fully uh, full eclipse, but when the sun is, it's just you know a void. Right, you know, and you can't even look at it. I guess maybe people in ancient times looked at it and burned out their, <laughs> their you know, yeah. burned out their, uh, you know, retinas or whatever. But, yeah. but they, they're so different, you know, and I, I would have thought that, you know, over time that, you know, with eclipses, they would have observed that really well, major difference. Well, so, so you're right. That the, the, I'm just saying that for the earliest observers, um, that they it would, you know, that they would have seen that they're relatively similar size, and I think that that's kind of an odd coincidence for it to have to try to struggle through. And so that's why I'm just suggesting that, for example, in mythology, there's often a sun god and a, a moon goddess, or a sun goddess and a moon god that are kind of balancing each other. Um, but you're right; by by a certain point of time, they are they have enough geometry that they are able to tell that the moon is, you know, is smaller. And so that's why, actually, in the Ptolemaic system, they understand, for example, like you say, from observing eclipses, that the moon is closer. And so they know it's smaller because of geometry, right? And so they've, they've done that kind of calculation. Um, they, uh, they are looking for, unfortunately, the, their calculation um, uh, ends up not being, um, they're not able to, there's other kinds of mysteries that, 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 the, that the observation won't help them with. So, for example, they're expecting um, because they, if the Earth was moving around the Sun, it's moving, and so they were expecting that the stars would ap have some kind of apparent motion against each other. But the reason why they don't is because they're so far away that it took until the middle or the end of the 19th century before we had equipment that you could actually verify that, right? So it was just completely impossible with the unaided eye to do that. So, okay, so this is anyway, the 12 signs of the zodiac are those constellations that are spread across the ecliptic and um, have been there since antiquity, um, so, so picked out as the important ones for this. Um, one of the things that we've said was a problem with the Ptolemaic system is that since, as we know, we actually are going around the sun, and so, for example, is Mars, that as we do that and at different rates, um, although Mars stays in that ecliptic, what ends up happening is as we kind of pass it uh, by, we're seeing it from different angles, and so the apparent motion that it has uh, is that it, it seems like it's been moving right along through the sky, night by night by night, and then it turns around and goes back, which, which, which astronomers or, or astrologers call retrograde motion, and then it goes back and goes again. And it's because of this overtaking uh, that happens in, uh, in how we now understand it. But the way then um, that was understood or explained uh, in antiquity is through the idea that there are these epicycles, 
So in other words, that even though they're in this particular sphere, each one of those planets, the planets is in, in itself then on another sphere, which is rotating maybe a different direction that is causing you know, a retrograde motion. And so anyway, that's how they solved that. And then Ptolemy fixed it with one more thing <laughs> because they didn't want to have ellipses. So we know that the orbits are elliptical. They want like circles and spheres are perfect. And so that was to, to Urgent's point, what about the sphere? <laughs> Uh, so in this case, this, all of the celestial uh, bodies are moving in spherical motion. And so in order to make that happen, um, the way it works is that, uh, that the, all the circles are going not around, for example, the Earth, but they're going around a eccentric, as it's called, that is between, that is a midpoint here between an equant and the Earth. And this is, these are just uh, mathematical points, and so they don't have any existence. But those mathematical points, when you put all of that together, um, you can explain all the observational data that takes you all the way into the capacity of um, uh, Renaissance time. Um, because essentially the mathematics will predict where the planets should be able to be observationally um, with this system. And so that's one of the reasons why this was able to last you know, as it did for 1,300 years or so. So um, yeah, 1,200 years. So the capacity to explain the observational data, it wasn't actually as important. We really, you know, since we have had science fiction, you have spaceships and you are, even though the science fiction is usually more space opera-y so because you can get around really fast, we're definitely thinking about all of this kind of from the outside and so from being in a spaceship and seeing how it all works. In this case, um, all of our ancestors, they were thinking about it from standing um, you know, on the, on the ground and looking up and seeing stars um, anywhere. I, you know, if I go outside after this and um, we can't see any stars here in Toronto, probably you may be able to see. It's cloudy um, tonight. And it's cloudy tonight <laughs> anyway, yeah. So even without that though, the light pollution means that I can only ever from, you know, see just a handful. Maybe if there's a bright planet, I can see a couple of those. Uh, and I have to use my, my phone app, which tells me where all the stars are, you know, and you can see, oh, there's all the stars down there in the Southern Hemisphere and all this, you know, but I can't see them in real life anywhere. Okay, so the use for predicting the future though. So, um, so we kind of mentioned the motion in the heavens, um, as everybody observed when you're looking at the heavens, it's more regular and predictable than motion than below the lunar sphere, the sublunar zone here that we all inhabit. So from antiquity, people then observed that there's this force at a distance, the sun warms the earth, the moon somehow affects the tides, uh, there's this thing where the mon mon monthly cycle is thought to anyway be related to the menstrual period. So it does seem like there's all kinds of strange forces at a distance that is very hard to wrap our heads around. And frankly, we've talked about it how like even um, when you're in the modern era uh, in the Cartesian system, trying to even figure out how, how magnetism is working, <laughs> you know, because no nothing's touching anything. How is gravitation working? <laughs> you know, because we would like something to be touching, you know, in other words, you know, in order to make that kind of thing happen. So it is hard in terms of a, even common sense to have theorized how to make, how to make force at a distance work. Um, so the way it's understood here is um, just like the humoralism of the uh, Western medicine, the astrology then builds on these elements. And as Urgent had pointed out before, in fact, that even though those, those are in the, uh, the, the order that they are, it goes air, you know, air, I'm sorry, fire, earth, air, water, fire, earth, air, water. So essentially, again, so it's so lucky that there's the magic number of 12 <laughs> because now we can have, um, you can divide up the four elements and every one of the um, star signs gets to be um, attached to one of the three elements. And so that's three times four and it's so a wonderful that, that thing. we are twice. Oh, do I? Yes. Oh, yeah, so it should be. What, what, am I, what am I missing? It's the definition of Leo. <laughs> <laughs> what am I missing? Libra. 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 Sorry. Ah. Libra. Uh, Leo and I meant to write Libra. Yeah. yeah, so I got confused. So yeah, so that should be Libra. Um, okay, so the idea then here, uh, and I don't know all of the ins and outs of astrology, and I'm not going to claim to, <laughs> um, but essentially the idea here is, is that uh, again, these are interconnected um, with the, the fact that the whole cosmos here is based on these same kinds of elements and in the same way that there's meant to be balance in the body. Um, each one of these things, these governing um, 
motions. So when the each one of the different planets, especially the sun, but the other ones too, are in uh, you know different places in the sky on different particular dates, including, for example, then where you are when the date when you were born, and so that's giving you your sun sign. But also just even doing horoscopes and things like that for finding auspicious days to do different things. It's based on then calculating where each one of these planets is against uh, against the. Um, the, the zodiac constellations that they would be, you know, uh, against. And so using um, Ptolemy's tables, um, you could very easily calculate that without having to go around and look and try to find them all. Uh, in fact, it's hard to find, no, no, no for sure. I mean, I, the way I can tell that I'm looking at that Jupiter or something like that is because my app tells me <laughs> that, that that's Jupiter in Virgo and not, you know, just some star I forgot exists, <laughs> you know. So anyway, so in all of those kind of ways then, uh, there's, this, there's this sense that because the heavens are all connected to us, everything is all connected in one perfect system, and we're able to see and, for example, predict things like months and seasons and any other number of things, including eclipses. Uh, likewise, then, there's some kind of um, information that is being presented us to us here that if we just were to figure out exactly, to calculate it exactly right, we would also be able to determine that this is an auspicious day to do something or that uh, based on who, what your particular, um, the auspices are on the day that you were born, the moment you were born, uh, whether right now is a, a propitious time for you to be doing this or that or whether you should just go back home and try not to, you know, be in a car accident or something like that, right? So that whole sense of that is, is interrelated to a much older idea of sympathetic magic, which is one of our earliest um, notions, I think, and uh, people can't help but feel, I think, still, it's still inside of us. And so um, based on this idea that the motion on Earth is connected to these heavenly bodies and they all share properties, um, so one of the things that sympathetic magic does is, for example, if the moon is governing certain qualities and certain powers, if you have, let's say, a little moon amulet, uh, you know, or something like that that you have with you, then that's bringing that kind of moonly power, you know, to you when you need that. So, or if it is governed by, you know, let's say the uh, the the warm force, then it may well be that something like that will affect the humor that you need, right? And so. Uh, in all those kind of senses. And so one of the ways that we still do, I mentioned that all the time, that we still do sympathetic magic too is essentially the idea is motion in the heavens affects motion here or motion here will affect some other kind of motion. And so you're at home, you're watching you know, the football game and somebody has thrown the big long pass and you'll go, uh, you know, so that it'll, so you, you know, everybody is, you know, move, moving, you know, or football or any game you're going to play, uh, you know, to try to make it go, you know, oh, you know, until so, so it'll actually move. So we, you're sympathetically causing sympathetic magic to move, you know, that, you know. So anyway, in that same kind of sense, this is kind of the idea of the system. Oh, so in this particular case, this is a, um, the, now when this has come across now to the West, this is a Spanish manuscript. Um, that is actually taking, um, it's like a big long catalog, and this is just Gemini, and it's taking all of these different um, embodied pictures of stars and constellations, and how each one of those different stars and constellations, when, F, um, when sharing the effect of Gemini, um, how that's going to affect, have, you know, effects on given days and things like that. So, um, trying to make a very complicated system. If it was simply a, a simple system, um, simple system would have the problem of just constantly producing error, right? <laughs> you know, so I, my, my favorite, um, my favorite, I've said before, my favorite uh, story, movie about um, uh, the life of Jesus is Monty Python's The Life of Brian. And when the, uh, the Magi, when the astrologers come, the three kings to give uh, Brian's mother, uh, you know, the, uh, the Frank, gold frankincense and myrrh, thinking that they have come to the right place to see, you know, the Christ child, um, she, she asks him, your astrologers say, eh? well, you know, you know, what is he then? And they say, well, he's our Lord, <laughs> the King of the Jews. He's the Messiah. And she says, and that, that's Capricorn, is it? <laughs> you know, so he says, no, that's just him. He says, oh, I, would, I was going to say, otherwise there'd be a lot of them. You know, <laughs> you know, so, but the idea of it is then that you have all of these additional, if you were going to just say everybody that's born, for example, in, 
in uh, Chinese astrology, if everybody's born on the year of the dog is going to all have the same fate, it seems a little, it wouldn't make a lot of sense because not everybody born in 1970 is doing all the same things that I'm doing. Some of the people in my graduating class of high school have died, you know, and that kind of a thing. And so the, the answer is that there's all of these additional calculations that have to be made that explain uh, why our original idea didn't really work, you know, in terms of the divination. <laughs> I don't know if it's legible. They yeah. call that synastry, the relationship between other um, constellations or other planets on your main Oh, excuse me. <laughs> it's okay. Um, in, in astrology today, they call yes. that synastry, which is the relationship between um, the planets or constellations on whatever particular planet you might be focusing on if it's your sun sign or so yeah that's the word sinistry sinistry there we go so this is a, already in the 13th century it's a, a chart of sinistry it's actually quite a beautiful chart okay and so just in the last you know just as to round this out <laughs> we'll bring in alchemy too and so um uh, medicine, astrology, alchemy. So alchemy, the name itself, we've got that al in the front of it, so we can see, identify quickly an Arabic loan word here from alchemia, alchemia um, which is the Arabic for it. It may, the, no, the, the Arabic is, it's, they're not sure, there's a dispute about what precisely, where that word came from. But it also shows then the traditions debt uh, in the West to the medieval Muslim natural philosophers um, from which it came including people like Avicenna again. So the forerunner then of modern chemistry, alchemists actually had a bunch of different um, procedures that they could do uh, that could actually perform quite useful chemical uh, processes. And so they were able through following different formulas, through the different, uh, you know, heating up the different stuff, doing, uh, doing different procedures that they would follow essentially in their medieval labs and they could actually um, um, you know, accomplish certain things with uh, different chemicals that they start with. And then they had a bunch of other stuff that whether or not was useful, it made for very impressive displays, <laughs> you know. So you know already from if you were in, in grade school that if you mix baking soda and vinegar together, maybe with some <laughs> red food coloring, then suddenly, you know, you can make a model volcano or there's a lot of other different chemical substances that kids like to play with and experiment with. They probably shouldn't, but anyway. And so, um, especially so, for example, things like mercury, which everybody has always thought is such a neat thing that maybe, maybe it's a medicine, <laughs> you know, which it's not really, you know. But anyway, that hasn't stopped people from saying, well, it's so cool, it must be, there must be something cool about it that you could use for medicine. But anyway, so all those kind of things that were either useful or just plain neat. And then though when you're taking into then this idea though that actually not the elemental theory that we have now where we're understanding that, uh, that iron and lead and gold are elements of and of themselves atomically, if you instead understand it that the underlying theory is that all objects are mixtures you know, just in proportion and, and method of these four classical elements, the natural philosophers of alchemy, you know, concluded that there would probably be some kind of way that if you just went through the right procedures, you would be able to transmute uh, base alloys that you have a, a dime a dozen. So all the lead in the world, you know, you could get fairly cheap. And of course, if you could make it into gold, then suddenly, you know, you would have all the gold in the world. And so, obviously, the theoretical agent for that is called, it's referred to as the philosopher's stone or the elixir of life. And so, uh, although um, really good alchemists like Avicenna um, discredited transmutation of substances, so he said those of the chemical craft know uh, well that no change can be affected in the different species of substances, so he understood them to you know, essentially gold is in its own species and you can't, no matter how much you might be able to make a show and make a, make a fancy so that you've essentially rusted something or made it look different or maybe taken and made an actual compound, you can't actually transmute one metal to another. Um, it can produce the appearance of change but not actual change, Avicenna said. Uh, nevertheless, the idea, once you get it in your head, that you can make gold, <laughs> you know, that's kind of one of those popular ideas like that you can um, divine the future. And so once you kind of have it kind of feeling like it's working, um, people continue to believe that. And so there's all kinds of legendary accounts that circulate so that people like, for example, Albert Magnus, who is one of the um, 
uh, greatest natural scientists and philosophers of the um, uh, and middle, and high Middle Ages, um, uh, he is like credited with as if he's there's accounts that people have that are legendary accounts where he's um, you know successfully once you know did do the transmutation and so now we just have to replicate whatever it was that in this legendary account Albert Magnus did you know uh, in order to our, ourselves be able to follow in that footsteps and you know break, make this breakthrough with the philosopher's stone so that we can have gold um, so. In that sense, um, you know, as we kind of like are pulling back to the big picture, I mean, here's a, um, I think, a wonderful medieval diagram that is bringing a lot of these ideas all together, which is uh, the person's body and, and essentially all of where the locations maybe of the humors and essentially the governing um, astrological sign that is related to each one of those different qualities. So you can kind of see on him, he's got the ram at the top and all the way down Sagittarius, you can see. <laughs> You know, these kind of images is there um, affecting different parts of the body according to this integrated system. So, so I don't think so. I think it's, it's, Latin. it's Latin. It's Latin. It's just in a, it's in a, in a, in a Gothic script that, really? yeah. yeah, but it's Latin. It's hard to, to read. There's so many ligatures and everything like that when you're reading those. Those, those are, you have to take uh, epigraphy courses in order to be able to get through each one of the different writings. Um, so our minds like to see these kind of patterns even amid randomness. That's certainly the case. And I think one of the reasons then that the ancient Greek system held sway for so many centuries then is this very seductive interconnectivity. So we had kind of one explanation for physics, motion, for uh, medicine, for cosmology. And they all relate then to these same elements that govern humors, stars, and every other kind of thing. Um, and so, and it was actually, you know, as we kind of uh, deconstructed all of those in, uh, in early modern science, it wasn't very easy uh, to be able to pull one out because as you kind of pull any particular thing out like the um, Ptolemaic system and try to replace it with the Copernican system, it's just, it's one one pillar that the whole rest of the thing is all connected to. And so you have to explain, well, why, how can you pull that pillar out? You know, what about all the other, the other parts, of, parts of this edifice, right? So, you know, I go back to my, <laughs> you know, this, you know, just like, is very excited, you know, like I say, medieval guy who was able to make the diagram, understand it all, even if there's problems, <laughs> you know, with, with how it all fits together. You can explain all those with epicycles and with, you know, <laughs> and every other kind of thing like that. And so, um, you know, this kind of thing, because, um, you know, there's legs. So I, I, I mentioned right at the outset of this when we did our test that I thought that the four humors were pretty well unknown to people. But in fact, I've seen on the internet that there's all kinds of different um, revivals of it. And you can take, um, you know, what your, what's your humor kind of uh, quizzes that have a lot more questions than the one we did tonight. And they come back with at you with this is quite a I didn't make this chart. <laughs> this is a chart I just got off the internet. You know, which is um, essentially defining whether you're an extrovert or an introvert in terms of your personality, whether you have stable emotions or unstable emotions, and then these these four categories. You know, sanguine, phlegmatic, melancholic, choleric, and so it's essentially part of a revived. Um, uh, humoralistic um, medicine that people do now as a neo-traditional medicine. And I just mentioned it, because I thought this one was interesting, <laughs> that, um, that the same exact things, so choleric, phlegmatic, sanguine, and melancholic, um, that those have been overlapped with the Myers-Briggs personality test. <laughs> and so I don't know if, if you've ever taken that, uh, you know, these kind of things, but essentially this is like where you're going to be either um, you know, any of four qualities, yes or no, essentially on all of them. So you're either an ANTJ or an ISFP, <laughs> whatever they all are. They're intuitive versus, you know, introvert or they, I try to, judging versus whatever they all are. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, and so though, I, and, um, and let's see, I always, whenever I've taken those, I always, I put a little star there to remember that I always get the result ENTJ. <laughs> And which is right there with a little yeah. star there. And I, I was also choleric, so it works. <laughs> <laughs> now, but I bring it up because, in fact, so um, Michael Ferguson, who 
as our neurologist who comes and uh, guest lectures. Um, the Myers-Briggs drives him totally nuts. He's like, because we have so many, he says, we have so many, uh, so much good neuroscience now that we can actually tell, you know, a lot of things about brain function, personality, and everything like that. And um, his view of, of this particular uh, tool is that it's about the same as the, as the humors. <laughs> so anyway, that's his view anyway. So uh, that's our little discussion on medieval <laughs> uh, science and sorcery. <laughs> Did we end up getting the folks in Barry to join us? Yes, all good in Barry. Hey, I want to welcome everybody from Barry here uh, who were able to join us. And anyway, at Barry Center Place, we really enjoy having you, and hopefully, um, you've enjoyed the experience on your end. <laughs> yes, Valerie. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you covered this earlier in the lecture, but I'm kind of surprised at what sounds like the popularity and acceptance of the astrological uh, system of thinking in view, uh, in view of that this was, you know, in a very uh, religious, yeah. you know, strongly uh, uh, Christian hegemonic time period. Yeah. Um, like earlier... Greek science, uh, science uh, you know, sort of of the, of the atomistic sort, especially since it was promoted by, um, like, Lucretius, and, and, you know, it was associated with hedonism, and also determinism was rejected right. uh, because only God can determine outcomes. Right. And so I'm wondering how the idea that stars and constellations can determine outcomes uh, squares with the idea that God is in control of everything, you know, the, you know, the Christian uh, uh, right. viewpoint, or for that matter, the, the Muslim viewpoint. And so, you know, it, was this seen as a type of paganism, or was it just so popular they couldn't stamp it out? Or No, I, I actually think um, it's that it gets integrated in. So it's, it's part, uh, it ends up being part of the Islamo-Judeo-Christian worldviews, which is that um, when they've decided that essentially that uh, God, the Creator, um, is the you know the first cause, the unmoved mover, um, as Aristotle had it, that in fact all of these kind of things this is this isn't unlike atomism or something like that, which contradicted the rest of the Aristotelian systems. This is integrated into it, um, and so as a result of that, um, the motion of the stars. Um, and planetary bodies causing force at a distance and maybe prefiguring what's going to happen um, is just showing, because God has made them all move and is what's causing all the celestial things to move in the first place, all you're doing is using um, natural philosophy or natural science in order to get um, access to uh, divine messages that you wouldn't otherwise have. And since God has given um, us reason, using your reason in order to you know, get access to more of God's marvelous works and things like that is, is is in the up and up. So I, I, I think that occasionally people would, um, you know, there would be, there would, the church is often against all kinds of things, <laughs> you know, and so, but I mean, so it would be very, I mean, but the, the popes were often very, very interested in their, in, in astrology and they would have court astrologers too. So um, in some sense it was, a, you know, sometimes they would, people would try to tank down on anything like that. And same thing on um, alchemy too. So on the one hand, an alchem alchemy alchemists could do things, and they would be court um, court natural philosophers in the in the in the course. But sometimes then they are also accused of essentially being necromancers and maybe in league with with evil spirits. And 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 they maybe even sometimes were doing stuff with spirits. <laughs> you know, they would have been maybe doing some of them are doing some kinds of conjuring. Although usually people. Um, Usually people think of themselves as doing white magic when they're doing that. And then in fact, actually a lot of the magical rituals will be involving sort of Christian focused stuff where they're saying the Lord's Prayer or they're doing all kinds of different, um, you know, using the host and the communion and that kind of thing in order to, to do the kind of magic tricks and things or magic or actually not only tricks, they're trying to actually have yield these kind of results using sympathetic magic. So I guess I would say that, you know, in that same sense, you could also argue that the medical part <laughs> You know, the fact that physicians are, are using essentially pagan science in order to try to write your humors, that's up against the saints who are um, the, using their, their relics and their intercession is actually causing supernatural cures over at the cathedral. And so in that sense, you may be, um, 
you would also maybe be you know wanting to tank down on or stamp out essentially um, non you know essentially physicians but in fact um, it's actually the it's actually the clerics that are doing all this stuff <laughs> they're the ones that are um, reading Latin you know they're they're the ones that are giving birth to I mean the universities to science it is the church so all of this intellectual revolution and um, and you know, recapturing of Greek science and philosophy is really happening, you know, in church circles. Much. Uh, I just wonder if there's a relationship again between East and West here, because uh, Vedic astrology is, you know, an, an entire system again that's somewhat similar. Yeah. Um, and it's the same thing with the humors. It looks a little bit like Ayurvedic. Uh, the Indian system. So, yeah. is it something like math uh, that came from India uh, via the the Arabic and the Greek uh, into Western? And so, I am not familiar enough with uh, South Asian astrology. I'm not. I'm barely familiar, frankly, with Western astrology, <laughs> yeah. um, but with South Asian to t to tell you that transmission route. But um, but certainly in the case of all of these things, where we are dealing with um, something that has this almost total overlap between the Muslim and Christian worlds. Like you say, the Muslim world is right next to those other worlds. Yeah. And so there's a pretty direct transmission line between China and Persia, and there's a pretty direct transmission line between both the Arab world and the Persian world and India. And so um, there's, like you say, um, what we call Arabic numerals come from India. Uh, and but we got them from the Arabs, so we call them Arabic <laughs> numerals, you know. And so in that same sense, there's um, I'm pretty I, some of these ideas maybe are coming from uh, the Greeks and are actually making it all the way to India. But some of them are uh, some of ideas about about elements in general, like idea that there's these kind of states: air, earth, fire, water, and maybe spirit or those kind of things. Those are maybe also you could potentially argue that those are happening in, separately in different places. But uh, same thing, looking at stars and divination, you know. So they don't have to transmit, but they could have. Kavach had a. Uh, as you uh, described, there is a co uh, continuation between the ancient uh, philosophy and the medieval science. Yeah. So uh, the templates are based on uh, the ancient uh, philosophy, as we might say. Uh, for instance, this idea of this. Fundamental elements. Yes. So, so uh, it is uh, maybe a compositional, and then the alchemy. The idea of alchemy is uh, uh, claims it's also decompositional way. Uh, so, if it is compositional, then it should be decompositional. So yes. we we might be able to uh, recompose. Yeah. Uh, but um, I what I wonder is. Is there some kind of a, um, maybe a spark, maybe a, a, a vague idea of this co this fundamentals and the composition? So this framework doesn't apply to human and human body. When when we when we uh, talk about, uh, for instance, this the analogies, these. I don't know how, how you called it, this black one and the yellow one? The black bile and the yellow but, Yeah, bile. so they are not fundamental elements. So they are some elements, but th right. they, they have the analogy, but th they are not the composing blocks. That's right. Yeah, because the, the blocks are still going to be air, earth, fire, and water. Yes. And so instead, it's the idea, like you say, of um, each of the bile has essentially a governing property in that same way that like a, a constellation is a fire sign, but is not the element, right? Because everything in the heavens is ether, including the, um, including all the constellations, but they are somehow because of the system they're they are associated with the, each element as a as an associated quality, like uh, like the bile is. Let's say it's not the bile is not fire, or it, I mean blood is not fire is the yeah. one that it's associated with. But it, it's but it's somehow that's its element is its governing. Um, property. Yeah, but uh, then uh, the decompositional uh, uh, concept disappears uh, mm. at that point. So what I'm trying to g get into is that the idea that uh, one uh, uh, metal could uh, transform into another 
through this decomposition doesn't apply to, for instance, life and uh, the species. And we are going to see this idea way later. Uh, so, so we, well, maybe, uh, I don't know, a any uh, species could uh, transform into other. Oh, uh, I see, yeah. Because there is this fundamental, maybe, uh, blocks. And yeah. uh, th th that, uh, why that idea doesn't, uh, is it? Well, by the way, it doesn't appear or Avicenna, uh, Avicenna art makes that argument. He says yeah. you can't do transmutation because of this, right? So I mean, so he and he's the best alchemist, you know. So so it's it's the other guys, and that would be a, probably a good argument that you could have added on to. I mean, I mean, essentially, Avicenna was saying you can't go between species. This transmutation doesn't actually happen, and so so the, so this really is the philosopher's stone. You know, is not just uh, a Harry Potter novel. It's also, you know, a fool's errand as far as like the the more um, <laughs> you know, you know the 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 thoughtful astrologer. I'm sorry, alchemist would have been because, like you're saying, it doesn't make a lot of sense that you could do that since you can't do that with 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 physical or with a uh, living matter, right? Like you say, you can't do a couple of procedures, and if you feed. Um, if you feed like some kind of different diet, you only feed oats to somebody, they're not going to suddenly turn into a horse, you know, be, uh, because that's not, part, that's not in their nature, you know, right? So that's a good, idea, good point. <laughs> good argument against transmutation. Uh, we'll do Valerie and then Elizabeth. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, with regards to um, what uh, the this uh, acquaintance of your, the neurologist, was saying, and yeah. that you know that uh, tests like the you know sort of uh, personality ta taxonomies like yeah. that are, uh, arrived at by the Myers Briggs, you know, where there's four basic types of personality, and there are other you know personality taxonomies like the person yeah. personality psychology has many schools of thought, but they tend to kind of hover around you know what what seem to be marked. You know, sort of stable personality traits, and the Myers Briggs, you know, might be one example of you know four sets of uh, stable personality traits. Now, the uh, neurochemists and neurologists, you know, deal with kind of the Lego of what makes up the bits that make yeah. up um, you know uh, various you know sort of uh, manifestations of, of behavior and personality, but the geneticists are doing something different and mm. what has been ascertained and they're working on now that the human genome has been um, revealed. Yep. Uh, one observation is that uh, some people have um, a, a gene that it has a variant from what's called short to long and it's kind of technical to say why short and long. I think it's the APEO4 gene. Okay. But if you have the long version, you're going to tend to be kind of a calmer person, more kind of upbeat, uh, what is sometimes called resilient under conditions of adversity. They're the kind of people that when they were babies, they didn't cry a lot. If you're born with the short version, like and there's an in-between, yeah. but if you're born with the short, you tend to be a little more delicate, a little more anxious, you know, cry a lot as a baby, kind of hard to soothe, um, tend not to um, deal uh, sort of like um, have as good a reaction to adversity. Yeah. And if you have heavy, heavy adversity in life, like, you know, abuse of childhood, extreme poverty, sort of dangerous neighborhood, whatever, the outcomes can be very grievous. And so that's already been determined that that can happen, and that right. applies to a lot of people. And they're working on other ones. So even though, you know, neurochemicals make that goal, so to speak, but there are these larger groupings that the geneticists are coming up with that kind of look like the older personality yeah, so you, divisions. So you've, you've found the uh, the genetic uh, component to sanguinity and melancholia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And choleric and everything like that. Yeah. So, well, I, I guess I'm, I just I just um, I just relate that Michael gets real cringy and angry when we talk about <laughs> Myers Briggs, and when he comes here, we'll get him to we'll get him to explain it. In based on you know, like also like you say, because I'm sure he's also very interested in the genetic component too. So that'll be really interesting when he's here. And Elizabeth will will have this be the final. I guess so. Um, <laughs> I've just been reading a book called Invisible. The Dangerous Allure of the Unseen. Mm. And most of it, it's about the 
influence on scientists, uh, and certainly up, up through the 19th and early 20th century, of uh, myth and magic and so on. It's really about the need humans have to make sense of the world, and if they aren't actually able to make sense of the world, if there are things you can't see and you can't make sense of, you fill it in with what you've got. Mm. And as for alchemy, <laughs> I remember uh, seeing an ad someplace in, a, I think, a health food magazine for some supplement that was silicon, but if you ingested it, it would turn into calcium and strengthen your bones. I'm not a chemist, I'm a <laughs> potter. I know that silicon <laughs> doesn't turn into calcium. <laughs> all right, well thank you very much and thank you all of you and thanks everybody for joining us online. And uh, remember next week we're gonna talk about the old Saxon Genesis. And um, I guess we'll swap places with uh, Leandro if he comes back. <laughs> and <laughs> That's not the one written by uh, Here you go. Uh, the man, um, 